Good afternoon, everyone. Glad to have you here for our session. My name is Wayne Abernathy. I'm Executive Vice President for Financial Institutions Policy at the American Bankers Association. But here at the Federalist Society, I am the chairman of the Financial Services Practice Group, who is sponsoring this session today, Financial Regulation, the Apotheosis of the Administrative State, which is a long term for a very important topic, and we very much appreciate you being here to listen from our very experienced, distinguished, and insightful panel. By the way, if you happen to be interested in the work of the Financial Services Practice Group at the, at the uh, Federalist Society, please contact me or one of the officers of the Federalist Society, and we can get you involved. Love to have as many people involved as possible. And now my important duty besides that is to introduce our moderator for today, Judge Carlos Bea. Judge Carlos Bea serves as a judge on the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. He received his bachelor's degree from Stanford University and his JD from Stanford Law School. Judge Bea was born in San Sebastian, Spain, and immigrated with his family to Cuba in 1939. In 1952, you might not notice it unless he stands up. Of course you will. Uh, Judge Bea served on the Cuban national basketball team at the Helsinki Olympics. Wish I could do that. <laughs> Uh, Judge Bea became a naturalized citizen of the United States in 1958. He taught courses in civil litigation, advocacy at Hastings law Co College of Law and Stanford Law School. From 1990 to 2003, Judge Bea served as judge of the San Francisco Superior Court. Judge Bea was nominated by President George W. Bush to the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit and confirmed in 2003. Please welcome Judge Bea. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, I think that we're required to give disclaimers at this point. Um, I played in the Olympic Games in 52, but I was a tourist. Uh, we went two and five in the games. Uh, I'm happy to say our son, Sebastian, however, is a real athlete. He won a silver medal in Sydney in the, in the men's pair for the United States. So, <laughs> um, Also, I don't want there to be any misconceptions uh, a gentleman walked up to me recently at a cocktail party and said, I, I greatly admire the opinions you write. And I told him that I thought he was operating under a case of mistaken identity because I only write dissents on the Ninth Circuit. <laughs> Today's subject, financial regulation, the apotheosis of the administrative state. Concern with a regulatory state often focuses on reforms of formal institution structures and legal doctrines such as the Chevron deference. But arguably, these formal constraints are only the tip of the iceberg regarding the issues of individual liberty and the rule of law raised by concerns of the regulatory state. We have a distinguished set of panelists today, knowledgeable about the financial industry, financial regulations and the effect of the administrative state. Your programs will have extensive resumes and biographies, so I will give you essentially name, rank, and serial number. Uh, to my right, uh, Professor Hal Scott, Nomura Professor of International Financial Systems and Director of the Committee on Capital uh, Market Regulations at the Harvard Law School. Professor Scott will talk on contagion a nicer word than panic. They can be caused, <laughs> they can cause a run on the economic system as being at the heart of the 2008 great financial recession. How the crisis was ended by the Federal Reserve System acting as a lender of last resort to banks and non-banks and using other tools and how the Dodds-Frank uh, legislation may impede such future actions in the f uh, by the Fed in the future if they're necessary. Uh, next will be Arthur Wilmarth, a professor of law 
at George Washington Law School who describes himself as a conservative with a small c. Uh, Professor Wilmarth will discuss the need to prevent the creation of government-sponsored enterprises, GSEs, and of measures that allow the creation of firms too big to fail, how we should limit federal safety nets and federal subsidies, and how we should take another look at universal banking, the combination of banks, security firms, and insurers into one entity, and perhaps consider the merits of the uh, former Glass-Steagall legislation. Uh, to my left is uh, Peter Wallison, Senior Fellow and Burns Fellow in Financial Policy of the American Enterprise Institute, who is currently writing a, writing a book on the growth of the administrative state. Mr. Wallison will discuss a system for the designation of firms as systemically important financial institutions. Is it CIFIs or SIFIs? Well, I call them CIFIs. CIFIs. <laughs> by the Dodds-Frank Act <laughs> that's created the Financial Security Oversight Council to include banks and non-banks. The standards or lack of standards used to designate firms and the effect of such designation as an example of the growth of standardless administrative power. Last but not least, Professor Richard Epstein, the Tisch Professor at NYU Law School, senior lecturer at Ch Chicago Law School and Bedford Senior Fellow at Hoover Institution, whose most recent book is The Classical Liberal Con Constitution, The Uncertain Quest for Limited Government. Professor Iste Epstein will center his remarks on the, on the recent case of PHH versus Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, which was in the DC Circuit and was granted and bank review and whether administrative agencies can be insulated from legislative, presidential, and judicial review. He will talk about the guaranteed budget of, uh, of the uh, Bureau from the Federal Reserve and how this Bureau fits in with the independent agencies and, muscle, and multiple board uh, members. Uh, with that, we give way to Professor, Professor Scott. I have to lower this microphone. <laughs> um, so uh, it's my pleasure to be here today. Um, contagion, which is a run on the financial system, was the heart of the 2008 financial crisis and others in the past. The crisis was halted in large part by the Fed's provision of lender of last resort assistance to non-banks as well as banks. Lehman's failure generated a run on the money market funds, whether or, not, whether or not exposed to Lehman, which then quickly spread to all short-term funding in the financial system, including commercial paper issued by non-financials and funding of major investment banks and bank-affiliated broker-dealers. The Fed responded by creating new facilities under Section 13.3 of the Federal Reserve Act to lend to these institutions. In addition, the FDIC raised deposit insurance levels from $100,000 to $250,000 and to infinity on demand deposit accounts so crucial to the payment system and the operation of the economy. It also guaranteed senior debt of depository institutions further assuring their access to funding. Treasury used its exchange stabilization fund to guarantee money market funds, and then ultimately Congress enacted the TARP which was used to provide capital injections into the banks. Now, these measures stopped the crisis, but in the aftermath were criticized as propagating moral hazard and bailing out Wall Street. Now, I do not regard the use of a lender of last resort where there is good collateral and, uh, when needed and a penalty rate as a bailout, nor do I regard deposit insurance as a bailout, but both are clearly government support, but in my view, highly desirable. TARP is a bailout and should only be available if the, if the failure of many large, important financial institutions at the same time would heavily impact the economy where their resolution as a group is not a viable option. Now, there is potential moral hazard 
from all of these measures. But in the case of lender and last resort and deposit insurance, uh, it is uh, small. I do not see how institutions, which are victims of panic runs, which is often the case with contagion, as opposed to bad business decisions, will take more risk as a result of such support. Do homeowners expose their buildings to the threat of fire from their neighbors because of the existence of a fire department? I don't think so. And we attempt, albeit imperfectly, to minimize the moral hazard from deposit insurance by charging premiums based on the riskiness of the insured, albeit that's a very difficult task to do. But due to bailout concerns, major restrictions were placed on the measures we took during the crisis. First, TARP uh, abolished the Treasury Authority to use the Exchange Stabilization Fund to guarantee the money market funds. Dodd-Frank then placed major restrictions on the use of 13.3, Section 13.3 of the Federal Reserve Act to provide assistance to non-banks, although, interestingly, the discount window, Section 10B of the Federal Reserve Act, continued to be available to banks without major restrictions. Now, what are these restrictions under 13.3 that go to non-banks? By the way, non-banks today, in terms of runnable liabilities, short-term liabilities that are not guaranteed, are about 66% of all runnable liabilities in the system, and they're going to grow as we see more and more disintermediation from the banking system in the so-called shadow banking. So the, the ability to lend to non-banks was important in 2008 and be even more important in the future. So what are the restrictions that the Fed put on this? The Fed can only lend to non-banks with the approval of the Secretary of Treasury, significantly limiting Fed independence. By the way, such approval is not required under the discount window for banks. Such loans must be part of a, quote, broad program, which may mean under the Fed's own regulation, which implements this section, that it must wait for five institutions to be in trouble, thus making it harder to nip contagion in the bud. Third, collateral is required for all loans. Previously, loans had to be collateralized to the satisfaction of the Fed, which allowed them to buy unsecured, highly rated commercial paper from non-financials during the crisis. Four, Fed can only lend to a solvent borrower, which is a sound principle, back to budget, uh, but difficult to actually determine in a crisis where asset values are uncertain. And five, loans to non-banks must be disclosed, disclosed within seven days to the chairman of the House Financial Services and Senate Banking Committees with the attendant risk that they may leak out, thus deterring bar borrowers from obtaining loans in the first place or accelerating the run uh, when, when the news does leak. And six, banks can no longer freely pass on to the broker-dealer affiliates loans obtained from the discount window. Instead, such pass-throughs are now subject to the to 23A of the Federal Reserve Act, which uh, allows them only to be 10 percent of the bank's capital. And even further restrictions on 13.3 have been passed by the House, uh, although not uh, by the Senate. In addition, the FDIC authority to raise deposit insurance limits in a crisis has been taken away, only to be restored upon request by FDIC through a joint resolution of Congress, making it impractical in a timely way, and the authority to make new loans under TOP has also expired. So let me just say a few words about lender of last resort. Am I happy with how the Fed operates as a lender of last resort? No. First, we need better coordination between fiscal authorities, Treasury, and lending Fed, where there is a reasonable possibility that the borrower may be insolvent or clearly is insolvent, as was the case with AIG. At the very least, we should regard any investment in equity by the Fed as outside their authority, which, of course, they did in AIG. That should be a fiscal decision reserved for the Treasury. Second. We, meet, we need more of a rule of law for the operations of the Fed as lender and last resort, as lender of last resort, in the sense that the Fed should articulate the general policies that it has on matters including facilities and programs, how they determine solvency, what a broad program really is, penalty rates, collateral, etc. Not only is ambiguity not constructive in this instance, it is positively harmful. With weapons deployed in advance, the very use of the lender of last resort might not be necessary. This is a lesson from Draghi's Eurozone declaration that the ECB would do whatever it takes to stop contagion. 
Critics legitimately criticized the Fed for operating without articulated constraints and doing so in, an in a non-transparent way. This is not tenable if the Fed is to exercise the powers that they need. A rule of law need not unduly confine discretion, but should articulate the principles for exercising such discretion. Finally, I would require that those institutions borrowing from the central bank or receiving fiscal support pay a sensible price, particularly where their own losses trigger the need for support. And this price could range from penalty rates to enhanced supervision or even the replacement of management. The failure to impose a cost on institutions benefiting from public support is a major factor for popular opposition to the use of these measures that we so successfully employed in 2008. Thank you. Good afternoon. I would like to thank the Federalist Society for inviting me to participate in this panel discussion. Uh, Madisonian conservatives, uh, among whom I would uh, class myself, uh, I think uh, uh, Professor Epstein's uh, reference to classical liberals I think fits the same group. Uh, I think Madisonian conservatives uh, should embrace and I hopefully would embrace uh, the following four principles of financial regulation. Okay, first, we should stop allowing privately owned financial institutions to operate in effect as government-sponsored enterprises with implicit federal guarantees. Uh, we all know about the sad stories of Fannie and Freddie. Uh, undeniably, privately owned government-sponsored enterprises, uh, a very costly, uh, I think, experience. Uh, I will argue that, that too big to fail financial conglomerates uh, are today's government-sponsored enterprises. Now, to achieve principle one, we have to end government policies that encourage financial institutions to become too big to fail and that reward them for doing so. Uh, third, uh, we must strictly limit the scope of the federal safety net for banks. Most would agree, certainly I do, that banks perform essential social purposes by accepting deposits from savers providing payment services, and making loans to small and medium-sized business firms who are not able to sell securities in the capital markets. Those are legitimate and important functions. Uh, banks are subject to depositor runs, partly because they have a maturity mismatch between their short-term liabilities and their longer-term assets. Uh, certainly, the Great Depression Proved, and I think the recent crisis also proved, if you look over, uh, for example, at the Northern Rock episode in the United Kingdom, that we need deposit insurance for chartered and supervised banks. We, I also agree uh, with Professor Scott that we need lender of last resort for chartered and supervised banks. Uh, I think I will differ with him on, on whether non-banks should be able to have that same privilege. Um, in my view, any additional forms of federal support for banks uh, should be carefully scrutinized because support means subsidy. Uh, last, in my view, we should oppose any form of federal subsidies for non-bank financial institutions and non-bank financial activities because federal subsidies will distort market pricing mechanisms, provide unfair competitive advantages to those who receive them, and undermine the effectiveness of market discipline. In my view, if non-banks want to have the benefit of the federal safety net, they should become chartered as banks and accept the same kind of supervision and regulation as banks. Uh, they shouldn't expect to get the same kind of help when they don't accept that kind of regulation and oversight. Uh, it is my view that universal banking, which allows banks to combine with securities firms and insurance companies and, and to engage in a full range of capital markets activities violates all four of the principles I've set forth above. The last crisis showed us that you cannot contain the federal safety net to banks when they are affiliated with all of these non-bank capital markets activities. You will save the entire conglomerate to save the bank. Two examples. The federal government provided $850 billion of combined support 
just to save two big bank-centered financial conglomerates, Citigroup and Bank of America. That's adding up their capital assistance, their lender of last resort assistance, their sale of commercial paper to the government, and debt guarantees they received. $850 billion just for two of them. And that's only a small part of the bill that we paid. The problem with Dodd-Frank, in my view, was that it did not change the universal banking model. Unlike the Glass-Steagall Act, which required a separation between banks and securities firms in 1933 in response to the Great Depression, Dodd-Frank basically took the approach of saying, well, we have these nuclear reactors that blew up. Rather than replacing the reactors or adopting a different form of reactor, let's just improve all the valves and controls and the tweaks. Uh, if we have better valves, better controls, maybe they won't blow up next time. Uh, in my view, that is, a, that is an unsound and, and uh, uh, unviable approach. Uh, my view is that the last 20 years have made clear, at least in my view, that, that these giant financial conglomerates cannot be either effectively managed or regulated. Uh, and if we don't change the business model, I am quite sure that we will have uh, a comparable financial crisis within the not distant future. So I'm going to suggest that I think we have two choices. One is to adopt what I would call an internal Glass-Steagall approach, which is similar to the ring fencing legislation adopted by the United Kingdom, which basically puts firewalls around the bank and says to the bank, you cannot make any loans, you cannot make any transfers of funds to your affiliates, and the government's not going to protect the affiliates. That's, that's a defensible approach. I think there's a, there are two big questions. One is, will these firewalls actually be uh, monitored and regulated effectively over the longer term? And secondly, when push comes to shove, uh, will the government actually refuse to bail out the affiliates outside the ring fence? The other approach would be to go back to 1933 and simply say, we want banks in one part of our financial system doing what they do, and we, and we want capital markets to operate outside the banking system and not depend on any subsidies related to the, uh, the banking system. Now, I agree with Professor Scott. We've got a big problem with shadow banking. The problem is that, that these non-bank uh, companies are essentially providing deposits. Section 21 of Glass-Steagall, which is still in the book, says no non-bank can accept any deposits, period. In fact, it's a criminal violation to do it. Uh, what are deposits? They are short-term debt instruments payable at par on demand. And we basically have exactly those kinds of instruments present today in things like very short-term commercial paper and money market funds, uh, and some forms of repos as well. Uh, if I agree with Morgan Ricks, who's written a very, uh, I think, influential and, and provocative book called The Money Problem, where he basically says money claims should be limited to banks. We didn't have shadow banks before about 1965. Uh, this is something we've allowed to happen, and it's distorting our entire system. So I think we have to get back to the point where we say, if you want to issue a short-term debt claim payable at par and demand, you have to be a bank. Whether that line is at 60 days out or 90 days out, I think somewhere in that range, we shouldn't be allowing other institutions to be issuing things that function like deposits. Uh, I, I look forward to our discussion after uh, our presentations. Thank you. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here, and I want to thank the Federalist Society for sponsoring this. This is a massive um, organization, done wonderful work. And uh, I'm just delighted to be a part of it. I'm going to talk about uh, basically the subject that I'm writing a book about now, which is the growth of the administrative state and why it has come about. <clears throat> and I, since I specialize in regulation of financial institutions, it will be from that perspective. So I'm going to be talking about uh, the Dodd-Frank Act and the uh, provision of the Dodd-Frank Act which allows uh, a group of uh, financial regulators uh, to designate certain institutions as systemically important financial institutions, and then to regulate them uh, very strictly. 
the the uh, Dodd-Frank Act created, I'm gonna go through some of the background which many of you know if you're part of the regulatory process, the financial regulatory process, but I'll just, just for those who are not, I wanna go through some of the background here so you all understand it. The Dodd-Frank Act created a new agency called the Financial Stability Oversight Council, uh, or FSOC, uh, to coordinate and oversee financial regulation in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis. The agency is headed by the Secretary of the Treasury and consists of all the federal financial regulators, the Fed, the FDIC, the SEC, and others, uh, and was given the power to designate any non-bank financial firm, non-bank financial firm, for special stringent regulation by the Federal Reserve. The firms that are designated are generally described as systemically important financial institutions, or SIFIs, uh, because their financial structure, uh, their financial failure or distress could in theory create a systemic breakdown in the United States economy. The precise language of section 113 of the act says that a financial firm may be designated by the, S uh, by the FSOC if its material financial distress or its activities could pose a threat to the financial stability of the United States. The provision was a response to the mistaken belief in Congress and elsewhere that Lehman's bankruptcy in September 2008 caused the financial crisis. The idea was that large firms are interconnected and the failure of one, like Lehman, will drag down others, creating a systemic uh, condition. To prevent this, special stringent regulation by the Fed was considered necessary. In reality, however, no other firm failed as a result of Lehman's failure. So the interconnectedness theory is wrong, but the law, as often happens, is still in effect. Accordingly, under the material financial distress or activities standard, the FSOC has designated four large non-bank financial institutions, AIG, Prudential Insurance, GE Capital, and MetLife. Designation can be a seriously destructive event to a firm because it gives the Fed virtually unlimited authority to control the firm's business. In fact, after having experienced Fed regulation, GE virtually terminated the business of its subsidiary, its huge subsidiary, GE Capital, in order to hopefully eliminate um, its designation, which was successful. But in the same, at, the same pride, at the same time, it eliminated a sig significant source of funding for small firms. MetLife, on the other hand, did not agree to its designation and sued the FSOC in the D.C. District Court. In March 2016, the court overturned MetLife's designation and the FSOC applied to the D.C. Circuit, which has not yet rendered a decision. Now, the relevance of all this uh, about Dodd-Frank is to the apotheosis, what a title, the apotheosis <laughs> of the administrative state. And that, of course, means all of you Greeks out there know that it means the high point of the administrative state. If it were the high point of the administrative state, administrative state, I would be happy. I'm afraid it's only the beginning. <laughs> to repeat the statutory language again, any non-bank financial firm can be designated as a SIFI and subjected to uh, this designation, this uh, special re regulation if it poses a threat to the stability of the United States. The act contains no standards that restrict the discretion of the FSOC. There is no definition of material financial distress, no definition of activities, no definition of threat, or what was meant by the financial stability of the United States. Nor does the act contain any statement of what size a firm must be before it can be designated as a SIFI. Yet, in the case of bank holding companies, Congress was able to set at least that much of a standard for these firms. If a bank holding company has more than $50 billion in assets, it will be sub subject to the stringent regulation of the Fed as a SIFI. In other words, 
To designate a firm as a SIFI, FSOC was authorized to predict that at some unknown time in the future, in an unknown future, the financial distress of a particular firm or its activities will have an adverse effect on the entire US financial system. This is impossible to know. No matter how skilled or expert the members of an administrative agency might be, they cannot predict the future. The decision is pure discretion. Moreover, the ability to stop certain activities can apply to a whole industry, giving the FSOC authority to control whole entire markets. But when the Congress gives these extraordinary discretionary powers to an administrative agency, it is further empowering the administrative state. The courts could stop this process, but they have not. Although the broad discretion given to the FSOC in this case could be considered an unconstitutional delegation of legislative power, the Supreme Court has not invoked this con concept since 1935, and many people think it's simply dead. One of the reasons for the court's reluctance is that we don't have a very good definition of the difference between legislation on the one hand and administrative action on the other but this should not be impossible for a court to decide and determine in individual cases. A legislative decision has one distinguishing characteristic. It can be wholly arbitrary, taking from some and giving to others, and does not require any justification as long as the Constitution is not violated. Just like Congress setting a $50 billion threshold for treating a bank holding company as a SIFI, that's an example of a legislative standard setting decision that is completely arbitrary. $50 billion makes no more sense than $200 billion in this context. So bank holding companies cannot and have not challenged that. They've challenged it legislatively. They have not challenged it in the courts because Congress is allowed to make those kinds of arbitrary decisions, which an administrative agency cannot. Once these key decisions are made, the administrative agency can be tasked to carry them out. This goes back to Chief Justice Marshall's decision in Wayman versus Southard in 1825, when he was also faced with this question of what's the difference between an administrative and a legislative decision. And his point was that the important issues, the important decisions are made by the legislature. The administrative agency can have some delegated responsibilities, but not for the important ones. This, of course, means someone has to determine what the important decisions actually are, and that is the responsibility of the courts under Article Three of the Constitution. The unwillingness of the courts to make these decisions is responsible for the growth of the administrative state that we are seeing now and will see in the future. Because, uh, because Congress has been happy to send difficult decisions to the administrative agencies. The framers, it turns out, were wrong in this respect. Congress will not jealously guard its powers. In addition, as Chief Justice Marshall said in Marbury and Madison, it, and we heard this uh, from the, to the Attorney General, um, it is emphatically the province and duty of the Judicial Department to say what the law is. Yet, if anything, the Supreme Court has gone the other way. Uh, in, in the Chevron line of cases, for example, they have deferred to the administrative agency's interpretation of what Congress authorized, and in effect, they are allowing the agencies to say what the law is. So, in the MetLife case, when MetLife won, the district court, court did actually not give the FSOC any deference, but they didn't decide that it had received dis excessive ex discretionary powers either. Instead, it said that FSOC's decision was arbitrary and capricious because it didn't consider the cost of designating MetLife um, something actually that was not required by the statute. 
In other words, although MetLife create, MetLife, the, the case created an opportunity for the court to consider the scope of discretion Congress gave to the FSOC, this decision does nothing to restrain that growth. Until the Supreme Court begins to use the authority to define where legislation ends and administration begins, the administrative state will continue to grow. Thanks very much. Peter speaks in his usual mo oh. Oh. dramatic entrance. <laughs> speaks in his usual dramatic way, and uh, I think essentially has been a consistent and accurate prophet of doom over these many years. My job is to continue and to see if I could find some horror story that will one up his, <laughs> explaining how it is that there are other horrors in the administrative state. Uh, the difference between us is I think the horrors that I'm about to talk about do have solutions where the ones that he has talked about are extremely difficult. And the thesis that I'm going to propose using PHA as a vehicle, if at least I can remember some of its facts, which I can't, is as follows. Uh, whenever you put together an administrative agency which has an independent status, it can only do one thing. Uh, that is, it, or two things, it could issue regulations and it could prosecute cases, but it cannot internalize inside the organization the functions of a federal district court uh, by putting together a panel or a commission, or in the case of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, I got that right, it took me a long time to memorize that. Um, you cannot put these people together to give them the power to adjudicate so that the only kind of judicial review that you can receive is that which comes from an appellate court. This is an issue which starts in financial regulation uh, with the PF, um, CB, uh, and, but it continues everywhere else. Many of you, I think, have followed the oil states case where exactly the same pattern takes place where only now it's the PTAB, which is the uh, patent uh, trial and appeal board, which is essentially designed to substitute uh, for the uh, uh, adjudicative system. And as we heard from General Sessions earlier on today, a separation of powers is indeed a very important protection of liberty because you'd never want to have a situation if one person holds all the keys to the safe. And if that person is very, very good, things may go pretty well. But if that person is very bad, then things will turn out to be horrid. And that's the risk that you always have to guard again systematically in all these cases. Uh, now, the situation that we have with the Elizabeth Warren child having to do with the uh, CFPB is, in fact, an absolute architectural masterpiece if what you do is you adhere to the progressive playbook on how it is that administrative agencies ought to be organized. And essentially what you believe is that there are people out there who are disembodied experts who, in fact, often turn out to be very rigorous partisan, and that what we have to do is to insulate them from political pressure so that what they can do is to peck the public from various kinds of abuses that are going to be inflicted upon them. Well, there is no question that a very powerful metaphor in the United States is the relationship between Wall Street on the one hand and Main Street on the other hand. And Wall Street is essentially thought to be a topic of disapprobation and therefore extensive regulation. And so when they put the CFPB together, what they did is they managed to do everything within their power to insulate it from various kinds of circumstances. They gave its head a five-year term. Uh, it turned out they gave it guaranteed budget protection by funding it through the Federal Reserve. And essentially, they gave the single commission a total and autonomous power with respect to the way in which you decide cases. And in the PHH case, you could see the powers that came through. There was a rather complicated financial transaction in which I thought liability was rather questionable, uh, but it had to do with the application of rules that had been put together by a predecessor organization and the extent to which they bound the, uh, bury the CFPB. And it turns out that what Mr. Cordray did is he said not only did he have the power, but unilaterally he decided to increase the fine from about $4 million to about $104 million, saying, I really think that this is a perfectly ideal situation to give a public spanking to a corporation which probably committed no kind of violation at all. And when the case comes up uh, to the district circuit on appeal, Judge Kavanaugh essentially decided that he was going to give them a choice. 
He said, if in fact what you want to do is to have a single commissioner, uh, then what you must be prepared to accept is that this person can now be removed at the pleasure of the pe president, at which point the Wall Street Journal began a remove cordre campaign um, on the grounds that he could be dismissed not only for cause, uh, but certainly at the will of the president. And on the other hand, he said, if you want to have these people insulated, as you may do, unfortunately, then the appropriate way in which to do that is to have a commission which has multiple parties on it uh, so that you could blunt the force of a single individual. In my own view, this is not a perfect protection, to put it mildly, because if you start to look at the many commissions that are put together with self same three to two majorities, the president's party having the deciding vote, what you discover is that there is a rigid partisan separation on virtually every kind of issue, and that the so-called expertise essentially is a cloak for very sharp political divisions and bias. Uh, the view that you have a court of general jurisdiction with judges by way of rotation sitting on these cases makes it much less likely that you could have this particular sort of division. And so I think, in effect, that the mistake in the Kavanaugh opinion is not that it went too far in trying to upset this particular feature of the administrative state, I think it did not go far enough, and that what we have to do is to come up with a consistent and powerful position, which essentially calls for the complete separation of the enforcement and regulatory function on the one side and the adjudicative function on the other. This does not solve all of your institutional problems, to be sure, because there's then always the further question, exactly what kind of body do you want to put together? And there is a question of whether you want specialized courts, like those that exist in taxation or bankruptcy, or whether you want to put them in courts of general jurisdiction. And on that question, I'm relatively agnostic, at least for this particular point, uh, because the long terms that are associated with these Article I courts, I think, gives them a certain insulation from political pressure. And the fact that these particular judges tend to be appointed by judges in the judiciary rather than the president tends to soften the kind of very sharp political division that otherwise takes place. But make no mistake about it. Uh, we have an agency after agency from the New Deal, uh, this very difficult situation of three two commissions or one zero commissions, and what is the problem associated with this? Well, not only do you have the problem of bias, but you have the problem of flip over. Every time there's a change in a presidential administration, the majority now goes from one party to another, and then you see the commission trying to undo the particular decisions that were made somewhere else. So you have exactly the same thing in the Securities and Exchange Commission, you have it with the NLRB and so forth. And indeed, in many ways, the SEC is one of the worst offenders on this particular situation because it has now institutionalized a process under which it turns out it could bring prosecutions before a judges of its own appointment. And you know, they don't quite have unanimous success, but if you're winning 97% of your cases in front of your own tribunal, <laughs> the only conclusion that you can read is that you're playing with, shall we say, a deck of mark cards, and that you do not want to allow that kind of a situation ever to exist. And so as I have three learned companions here, all who spoke about the arcana of various issues associated with financial regulation, I'm basically making a rather simple-minded point uh, that goes back to the principles of separation of powers at the beginning of the republic, applies in financial areas, but it seems to me carries on pretty much everywhere else, and that what we have to do is to understand we will never undo the administrative state, nor should we even try, given the complexity of functions that government has to do. Uh, but none of these complexities justify the current amalgamation of adjudication, of legislation, and um, prosecution in the same agency. And what you do is you hive off the judicial function, and the agencies will run just fine, and the rest of the public can take a deeper breath and sleep more quietly and contentedly at night. Thank you. I'd like to open up the uh, conversation among the members of the panel, uh, but one th thought struck me um, when we first had a conference call a couple of weeks ago, and I was waiting for somebody to say something on this subject. Does anybody have anything nice to say about Dodd-Frank? Yes, it's short. <laughs> <laughs> I have another nice thing to say about it. Most of the regulations under it have yet to be issued because it's only seven years since its adoption. <laughs> All right. Uh, 
Professor Scott, I was uh, thinking, as, as you were talking about the lender of last resort, the classical theory of lender of last resort, as I remember my history, economics history, was uh, uh, Mr. Badgett, who was the uh, publisher of The Economist magazine, and he said, lend freely, but at high rates. We've lent freely at very low rates. Um, is this emblematic of a, of a new economic theory? <laughs> well, um, you're, you're making a good point. Uh, let's go back to the 2008 crisis. Uh, this was a particular problem for banks under the discount window. So the Fed had a 50 basis point penalty rate for borrowing at the window when the crisis occurred. And lo and behold, nobody came to them to borrow. And they knew the banks were in trouble. Okay. So they lowered the rate to 25 basis points, still a penalty. This is over market rate. Okay. Still nobody came. Why? Because the banks were concerned, who needed the money, if they came to the Fed, even though the Fed uh, had no obligation to disclose the identity of particular borrowers, that this would leak out okay, through reports that the Fed issued where you could kind of infer who the borrower was. If somebody borrowed in the North Carolina area, you could say Bank of America. Okay. So they still did not borrow. So what the Fed then did is create something called a term auction facility where any bank could borrow at an auction rate. Okay. And then they borrowed because you couldn't tell the good banks from the bad banks who were borrowing. So here's the dilemma okay, that was exposed in 2008, if the penalty rate is high, yes. or if you specifically penalize the borrower, I mean, so and then that particular borrower leaks out, they won't borrow, situation gets worse, and you know you even have a, a, a more difficult problem. So uh, you know, they should pay a penalty. Whether it should be a penalty in, in the form of the penalty rate or something else, for instance, discipline and management, or some other consequence. There should definitely be a consequence. But there's just too much information out there. No. Hmm? Too, too much information out there as to, as to who's borrowing. Well, it, it, it would leak out. That was the concern. OK. Uh, call us? Judge Bay, I, yeah. I, I'd like to comment on your question. No, I think, I oh, sorry. No, go ahead, first. Which, which I think is a good one. Uh, there are studies which I've cited, uh, for example, which showed that uh, the term auction facility and other uh, lending uh, facilities that, that Bank of America received, they, they paid a, an effective interest rate of 0.8 percent. Even Goldman paid 1.4. Uh, those are rates that no one else could have gotten at the market. So that's part of my point about once you create these two big to fail institutions and you basically decide, like nuclear reactors, that they're not going to be allowed to fail you're going to do anything necessary to subsidize them. These were enormous subsidies that they received. Yeah. Yeah, I have another point, which is related to that. I mean, what Hal says essentially is the standard dilemma. We charge you a fair market rate, you're down to fail. If we charge you at other rate, you're down to get an excessive subsidy. One of the things that's wrong about the whole Federal Reserve lending system is that it only allows the government as a lender to take back interest rates. In my view, if you start thinking about the flexibility, which was abused but nonetheless available on the Federal Housing Financial Act, what they do is they allow the government to take an equity piece of some sort or another. And so what you can say is, all right, we're going to give you a situation where you get 2.0% interest. But by the way, when this thing goes up, welcome, my friend, to an equity kicker. Uh, because we now own 15% of this business at such and such a rate, 20% at that kind of a rate. Oh, we'll take it out, and we may sell it back out in the open market at some point or another. But it will allow for the recoupment. So essentially what happens is you don't want people in the lending business to have to make an all or nothing judgment at the front end on success or failure. You'd rather have this thing as an absolute plus a contingent process. And if you were to change the nature of the situation, you could do it. Now with the AIG situation, just to finish this up, what happens is you don't have that flexibility. So Davis Polk essentially created a sham transaction in which you had a third uh, party corporation uh, which announced that it was taking equity. The problem was owned completely by the United States government. And then you got on silly litigation before Judge Wheeler in DC and Earl and Meyer, I think it was in New York. Um, so you don't want to essentially force people to have the wrong statute and then give the wrong result. So what you really have to understand, and this is my last sentence, is when you call the Fed the lender of last resort, the word lender is a very dangerous term because what it does is it limits the way in which you could provide relief 
No private party which is going to come and give some kind of an assistance would either say it's going to be a loan or nothing, and we should not handicap the Fed in that particular way. I'd like to make a, a comment about this whole question of uh, too big to fail, because I don't think people are making enough in the way of distinctions on this issue. Um, when we say banks, or when you read in the press that the banks uh, were too big to fail, um, there's, uh, there's some distinctions that should be made. Bank holding companies are ordinary corporations. I don't think that they are too big to fail. And I think what we saw in the financial crisis when Lehman failed was that there isn't any interconnection between the, these very large financial institutions so that when one fails, it will drag down others. Now, the too big to fail institutions are the banks, the ones that are the deposit takers that have um, uh, deposit insurance, and they are gigantic. We have four of them that are over about or over the trillion dollar mark. Those institutions are too big to fail. They are not covered by the Dodd-Frank Act. They are still under the jurisdiction of the FDIC, uh, which has no nothing like the resources that is necessary to deal with the failure of a bank. Let's leave aside bank holding companies. Um, so we are still in a position where we have no way of handling the failure of one of these very large institutions. Now, I'm not at this point trying to propose any kind of action, but what we ought to understand is that the Dodd-Frank Act, which was intended to deal with the too-big-to-fail problem, is a total failure at that because it doesn't deal with the real institutions that could cause a financial crisis if one of them failed. Uh, uh, Professor Wilmarth, you um, are suggesting that we go back to a d division under the Carter, uh, the Glass-Steagall Act. Um, as I remember, when the Glass-Steagall Act was gotten rid of, the idea was that our banks here in America could not compete with the foreign banks that were doing universal banking. And that the reason we uh, were abolishing uh, Glass-Steagall was uh, to be able to compete in the universal globalist market. Is that not a problem? You know, there's been a lot of discussion about that. If you go back to the 90s, for example, uh, the European banks all said they couldn't compete uh, with our major institutions, including the, the specialized banks, the specialized investment banks like Goldman, Morgan Stanley, uh, Merrill Lynch, uh, uh, what was then the old J.P. Morgan. In other words, uh, from what I've read, uh, our institutions were doing extremely well. Uh, I think that was. Um, in my view, a story that was told. Uh, certainly, uh, 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 I think that if, if you went back to a, a pre, a pre uh, what was then Graham Leach Bali, if you went back to a pre Graham Leach Bali uh, atmosphere, I think you would have institutions that were more specialized, more focused, uh, and I think they would be better at what they do. I mean, I think we've had more problems once you've had an institution that's trying to do everything. I think when you try to do everything, you tend not to do anything that well. Professor right. Scott? Um, banking crises are almost universally caused by bad loans, not by securities activities, OK? So if you want to make sure that you're not subsidizing this banking system, let them do everything but making loans. Uh, the, the idea of broadening their powers, uh, the, the major argument was in terms of risk, okay? So that you were diversifying, okay, their activities, you know, to decrease the overall risk of their enterprise. That idea, to me, is totally valid, okay? Um, and um, so I, I don't uh, think we want to go back to the world in which uh, if the bank part goes down, the whole thing necessarily goes down. I think it's good that we have diversification in the banking system. Yeah, can I add to that also? And that is that um, the reason why the, there was a, a permission for bank holding companies to acquire securities firms and other kinds of financial institutions was because if you look at the data, you will see that most 
of the financing that is done in this country is done through the securities markets. Mm -hmm. And the trend is all in that direction. The banks have been basically flat in terms of the financing that they provide to the corporate world. So if you want to have successful financial institutions, you cannot freeze them into a, into a, a position where they are basically losing their role in the economy. They have to be allowed, as I see it, to compete in the areas that are growing, and that is the securities markets. Yeah, um, I agree with all of this, and I, I'd like to make one other point, is that you always want to reverse engineer past failures. Uh, it may not cure against future mistakes, but at least you don't make the same dumb mistake twice. And, and certainly, if you start looking back at, say, banking practices in the 1930s and 40s, it was very common to have situations where the loans would be limited to 50% of asset value, very low. And it turns out you don't get a lot of leverage and you don't get yourself a lot of failures. And what we then did is we decided, nope, we want to goose up uh, uh, home ownership as an independent ideal. Anytime you have an in-state ideal, it's a mistake. Um, it turns out that if home ownership is good, it should be able to survive without having crazy subsidies. Uh, what you then do is you tell the banks, well, we would like you to lend at 80 or 90 percent, or sometimes even 98 percent. Well, nobody's going to do that unless you give themselves a guarantee. So what you do is you then have the implicit Fannie and Freddie guarantee. Uh, implicit guarantees are always terrible because you don't know exactly how much they cost. They're not on the books. Implicit guarantees are terrible because they always create some opportunity by the government to propose some sort of collateral obligation on you like community redevelopment loans, which are, generally speaking, a complete disaster in this particular area. And then the bill comes through because of the social failure. Uh, so what you have to do is not only let banks compete in markets in which there's potential growth, securities, and so forth, but you cannot go back to another system in which there are any implicit guarantees uh, that can come through, because what we will then do is see a repetition of what happened in, in 2008. And that's not exactly what happened, is, you know, Fannie and Freddie may be out of that, then there's some federal housing bureau which will pick up the slack, because the political situation for racial, non-racial reasons alike, the subsidized home ownership and so forth is so great uh, that what happens is the way in which we seem to think that we will beat the odds is we take a huge number of losing bets. And then what we somehow assume is that through the law of large numbers that this will all work out. Whereas in the old days in the Jewish garment business, this was the joke, is it says you don't make up what you lose on every piece by having large volume. And that's something that the lenders in the United States seems not to have learned. Could I have a, just a brief response, which is uh, my view is, from, based on my study, the key catalysts for the crisis were mortgage-backed securities, collateralized debt, op default collateralized debt obligations, and credit default swaps. Okay. Yeah. You securitized really bad loans, and you sold them around the world pretending that they were good, just like the, the big banks did foreign bonds in the 1920s. Okay. And then you used credit default swaps, which were a form of insurance, to, to convince people, oh, someone will cover this if, if things go wrong. Uh, so we basically, again, combined banking with securities and insurance and peddled what was really terrible stuff as if it was good guaranteed stuff. And when everything blew up, Uncle Sam had to step in because the institutions that were doing this were so gigantic uh, that they, they couldn't be allowed to fail. Now, again, I think the moral hazard that you get when you basically say, I'm not putting the loans in my own portfolio. I can package them up in securities, sell them around the world, get AAA ratings by bribing the credit ratings agencies, and get AIG to provide me credit default swaps to back them up. I mean, there were a series of perverse incentives. So my view is, look at the conflicts of interest created by uh, universal banking. The last thing I would say is, there was an interesting article on, on Deutsche Bank the other day. Deutsche Bank is, is one of the big European universal banks. They pointed out that the shareholders of Deutsche Bank had gotten something like uh, $15 billion of euros of dividends over the life of Deutsche Bank since 2001. Insiders of Deutsche Bank had gotten $71 billion of euros in bonuses. The universal bank franchise has been a bonanza for the insiders. They have made out like bandits. Shareholders, not so well. Good. Thank you. Yeah, one, a comment on, of course, on, on what you said. Uh, we've been debating this for years, but um, the way it was phrased is that the banks sold 
these mortgage-backed securities around the world. In fact, they were bought, is the other way to look at it. They were bought around the world. And why were they bought around the world? Because the government's housing policy here in the United States caused a gigantic bubble, a bubble that was far beyond any we'd ever had in the past. And what was happening in the bubble is that um, people were taking out mortgages with good high rates on them. The banks were willing to lend to them or others were willing to lend to them because there were no defaults. There are never any defaults, or very few at least, when there's a bubble because everyone can refinance in the United States without any problem. So you never see defaults, but you see high rates and people in Europe and also elsewhere around the world wanted these obligations. So the banks actually were running out of uh, yeah. the available uh, mortgages as things got hotter and hotter toward 2008 and began to use credit default swaps. Now, I want to say one thing about, to, you can use a credit default swap to imitate an actual mortgage-backed security, which is what they did. But I want to say one thing about credit default swaps, it's a very complicated subject, of course, but Lehman Brothers was a big player in the credit default swap market. When they failed suddenly, without any warning, the credit default swap market kept operating all through the financial crisis. So don't get frightened by something like a credit default swap. It turns out that it is not as harmful as people suggest it is. And it is very useful for institutions to manage their risk. And what we've done with credit default swaps since the crisis in the Dodd-Frank Act is to make that much more difficult and also to set up a set of um, institutions, uh, financial market utilities they're called, um, which are now backed by the Fed and which will be the cause of the next, next crisis. crisis. Yeah, um, you got it. Just, just one sort of comment on this stuff. One of the things about regulation and about financial businesses is the way in which they look at their book of business. Uh, essentially, if you're a responsible, responsible financial company, you start thinking about diversification and all the rest of that stuff. What you do is you look at an entire portfolio of asset and see essentially its internal stability. So you may have some credit default swaps or other kinds of derivative institutions that may look highly loaded in one direction or the other, but if you've got physical assets on the other side that sort of complement them, uh, the volatility of the portfolio is far lower than the volatility of one of its components. When a regulator comes in, it turns out that you have these jurisdictional boundary lines, so it's often the case that the default swaps are going to be regulated by one guy and the physical assets are going to be regulated by another, and each of them are going to see an unstable portfolio because they can't take into account the other kind of the operation. Uh, so what happens is this regulatory provincialism tends to exacerbate risks that market institutions are designed to essentially control. And so the reason I chimed in with Peter is because essentially what we now do is have another one of these regulatory hothouses which is going to have blinkered vision on it. And generally speaking, since it's getting only limited information, it's going to make a systematic mistake with respect to the volatility of the portfolios, which means that when it comes to regulations and interventions, it's likely to get them wrong. And that's what you're saying, that was right? The apotheosis of Thank you. <laughs> no, I mean, smart regulation. Trust it to Peter and me, and Arthur, <laughs> and Hop. You know, we do a fine job. I'd like to open the, uh, the session to questions from the audience now. I would ask you, Two things. When you ask your question, identify who you are and where you're from. And secondly, make it a question. Thank, thank you. you. So sure. first of all, here in front. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Bert Ely. I'm a banking consultant here in Washington and very active with the Federal Society's uh, uh, Financial Institutions Practice Group. Uh, following up on uh, Professor Wilmar's comments, I have a very simple question for the panel. What should be the federal government's response, if any, should a funding crisis and cons consequent contagion erupt in the shadow banking world and, given the requirements of mark-to-market -market accounting, trigger substantial capital losses in FDIC-insured banks, which in turn triggers the costly failure of some of those banks? Again, a very simple question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to take that one out? I, I, I mean, my, my simple-minded response is 
we have to change the status quo, right? The status quo is, is unacceptable because I agree with, uh, with Bert. That's, the, that's what we're facing if we don't change it. Uh, now, is it, is it a magic bullet to get all that short-term money back inside banks? Not a magic bullet, but then at least you know where it is and you can regulate it and you can begin to respond to it and begin to charge deposit insurance premiums and other things to offset it. Right now, we don't know where a lot of these claims even are. The regulators don't know, for example, the whole scope of the repo market. Uh, and uh, credit default swaps, lots of luck. I mean, so that's the problem of 2008. We didn't know, the regulators didn't know that AIG uh, had $80 billion of credit default swaps and, and we're gonna bring down uh, many financial issues. One, one last example, $50 billion, okay, $50 billion of the bailout for AIG was paid through directly uh, as 100% coverage on their credit default swaps to major financial institutions, including every one you can name in the United States and, 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 and Europe. If they had not done that, the CDS market would have collapsed and some of those institutions would have been in serious trouble. So the AIG bailout was a CDS bailout, among other things. So just to be, just to be clear about what happened. Well, just sending opinions from uh, Professor Scott. <laughs> yeah, well, just on There's that. There's so much to disagree the, the, with. Let me just say one, one thing, and that is all of this all of this uh, faith in regulation is remarkable when you understand that the banks that got into trouble, as Arthur was talking about, were all heavily regulated and the regulators were inside them every day. And so still they didn't know what was going on. What happens with regulation is that people believe, like Arthur does, that regulation stops risk taking and as a result of that, they put more money in banks or make more investments in banks when if they were uh, aware of what the risks were, instead of relying on the regulators, they wouldn't. Look, I, I have another point. One of the things about these credit default swap, can I talk or not? I was gonna call on Professor Scott. He had oh, call on, why would I interfere? Uh, just a factual point. Uh, if you look at the exposures on the CDS portfolio of AIG uh, and look at the major counterparties, you take Goldman Sachs as an example. Goldman Sachs had 18% of its capital at risk from the failure of AIG, 18%. That's a large number, but it's not close to insolvency, going back to Peter's point about the lack of connectedness. And that 18% number doesn't count the CDSs that Goldman purchased on AIG itself as a hedge against yes, the inability yeah. of AIG to pay off on the CDSs. So if you take that into account, the, the exposure of the counterparties was, is, it, is that surprising? Risk 101, you don't put all your eggs in one basket to a counterparty. And I, I think Goldman understand yeah. that idea. I, okay. I was gonna make a similar point, which so, is that- So the fact of the matter is art, if, AIG had not been saved by the Fed, Goldman would have been fine. Maybe Goldman would have been, but not some I, others. And, and no, the I, other I, counterparties were in similar positions. Yeah, look, I mean, one of the other things to understand about Goldman is these were not just hedges as promised to promises. They also took security interests of one kind or another, if I'm not mistaken, right? That's so counted what, in the 18%. What? I don't even know what, see, you know all the technical stuff. I just, the basic <laughs> point that I'm trying to make is a, a sort of, on this one is a kind of a simple thing, which is one of the reasons why you run the flow through is in the alternative of what you're gonna do is gonna get a kind of a foreclosure. And the financial markets with their repos are organized in a way which allows for instantaneous foreclosures independent of the usual rules on mortgage markets. And so that that also kind of protects things. So you, you have to protect Goldman in order to get out AIG, because otherwise Goldman will protect itself. The other point I wanted to make on mark to market, uh, this is a, I think it's a twofold answer. To the extent that you have readily tradable market prices on various things, marking to market on a daily basis is perfectly sensible. Uh, but what happened in 1988 and so forth, and which could happen again, is we are trying to mark to market those kinds of securities that do not have a ready market, and then in effect what you do is you deny a regulated bank the thing that most of them which is want most, which is the ability to say, I'm gonna keep my assets off the market during a bad period of time and wait to some time later. 
And it's that inability to delay, which then forces them into markets, which then lowers the price even further, at which point the cycle starts to complete. Uh, so what happens is instead of thinking that this is a regulated institution, think of it as a single owner of a particular asset and ask yourself whether or not in bad markets the owner of a house is under a duty to sell um, in these circumstances. And I think in that case, you fundamentally want to change mark to market because in one case it's valuable and in the other I think it's quite perverse. Uh, in the back, question. Um, so about these systemically important institutions, uh, it seems to me that once they've been designated as that, the federal government's uh, taking a lot of control of the internal governance uh, away from the shareholders. And to me, that should really be classified as a taking. I mean, you have the government instituting for public purposes and taking control away from people's private property interests in the company that they own share or shares in. Uh, you know, I, I think changing that would really improve a lot of the things from the judicial philosophy, at least. Did I hear you talk about takings? <laughs> <laughs> Can I answer? Look, I mean, the answer about this is it, takings is half the problem, but there's a second half of the problem which is whether or not when the government takes it gives you some kind of just compensation for the law so that the shareholders would regard themselves as better off than before. And, and if in fact you are running a sensible kind of a bailout program where they inject money into this situation which gives you liquidity and takes back a senior interest, that's fine. And that was maybe, but arguably, the situation that you have with FHFA and Fannie and Freddie with the 2008 September bailout when they took a 10% dividend on preferred stock for money that was put in. Uh, but when they then switched the terms of compensation so that the amount that you get is nothing ever and then announced that since you're getting nothing ever, you should be extremely happy because if you ever had nothing, we wouldn't take it from you anyhow which is the government's position, <laughs> then it becomes that. So what happens is the reason the question is right is the takings issue is always raised, but you have to look at both sides of the problem. And what happens in many of these cases, most notably with the GSEs, is that nothing whatsoever was given to the shareholders when this thing was confiscated. And what was so terrible about this is that if you look politically, um, there's kind of a bipartisan willingness to steal um, on both the Republican and the Democratic side. And I've written about this thing for years on, on behalf of these hedge funds. And I'm always amazed at the casual arguments that people make saying that we regard FHFA as a faithful agent of the individuals whom it's milking every dollar that they have. <laughs> uh, All right, yeah, good. Another question. I'm Kai Alberg from Port Angeles, Washington. I'd like to ask the panelists, if you had a magic wand you could wave over Dodd-Frank, what parts of it would you amend or repeal? And then turning to reality, what, if anything, do you think is it realistic to expect is likely to happen with regard to Dodd-Frank reform during the current <laughs> presidential term? Well, let me, let me try that. I'll answer the right. second. It's easier than the first. Um, uh, you know, there's a bipartisan bill that was introduced this week, which basically um, tries to reduce the burdens of Dodd-Frank and limit them to, in some cases, um, banks that are under $250 billion, and in other cases, even smaller banks. It depends on which provisions of Dodd-Frank. Bipartisan, I, I would say there's a very good chance it will pass. I think that'll be it. <laughs> okay, uh, so uh, there's such a, a narrow uh, majority of the Republicans in the Senate and such disagreement among those Republicans uh, that I think any other practical uh, fix to Dodd-Frank other than for smaller banks, which I think we'll see, uh, will not pass. In terms of, you know, what I would, uh, my, I would sort of scrap Dodd-Frank and start over. Thank yeah. you. Anybody else want to comment? Yeah, I, I'd mention two things right off the bat, and that is the, the Financial Stability Oversight Council should be closed down. It's a, it's a danger. And to the extent that they go into things such as activities, which many people have been for, that is a real danger when they are going to be able to stop entire markets from operating or entire industries from operating operating because they don't like the way they are operating. Now, that probably won't happen um, in the Trump administration, but it could well happen in the next administration if it turns out to be yeah. from the left. Um, first of all, I think the uh, 
CFPB, you know, mark for extinction would not be a bad thing and reassign its uh, regulatory authorities to other agencies which are uh, perhaps better able to do it. But the one that I particularly hate, which is self-contained and separate, is the Durban Amendment, which sort of wrecked the debit card markets for, for many years by announcing that the interchange system, which had been the greatest success in financial innovation over the last 15 years, was completely crazy because it allowed, essentially, uh, people to um, charge the debit card holders a transaction fee and they wanted to drive it to zero. That's separate. I mean, people like Todd Zawicki, who may end up running, if the Lord is kind to us, um, the Consumer Protection, Financial Protection Board, um, has essentially killed off all sorts of innovation in this particular banking section. And the reason why I think it may be repairable is not only are its effects particularly odious in many cases, but it's separable from the rest of the statute. And at that particular point, the interaction and overlap problems are much less severe than they are with trying to deal, for example, with SIFIs. Arthur? Uh, I certainly agree that you know, regulatory relief for the traditional community banks is long, long overdue. Among, among other things, uh, we impose Basel international capital requirements on traditional community banks. It makes no sense whatsoever. I mean, they, they are the ones who are doing you know, what, what I, I believe banks are supposed to be doing, and they're the lifeblood of most of our smaller, medium-sized communities. If we want a startup culture, we need these banks. Uh, we're loading them down with way too many mandates. Uh, I hope that can be accomplished, if nothing else. Could I just add that I don't think the villain of the piece is all Dodd Frank, and this is what Art has just alluded to. A big villain of the piece resides outside the United States in the form of the Basel Committee and the Financial Stability Board. Okay, the two major regulations that have really affected growth, economic growth in this country, are capital and liquidity requirements. Those did not originate in the Dodd Frank legislation, they came out of the Basel Committee and the Financial Stability Board. So how we deal with these international organizations going forward in terms of providing regulatory relief is absolutely crucial. This is only, not only an issue about Dodd-Frank. Next question. Thank you. Uh, my name is Carl Domino. I am an attorney, but since 1972, I've been a money manager in the equity markets. And as a general proposition, I'd say that uh, the big declines we've had have always been caused by something different. Inflation in the 70s, portfolio insurance the dot-com bu bubble, the financial crisis. So as a money manager, I'm always looking for the next thing. I mean, everything you said is great. I've studied it. I'm not sure if that's not the uh, uh, last word. I don't know if any of you had looked at what Jamie Dimon said was a fraud. It's very small now. It's growing rapidly, and that's Bitcoin. It looks like the tulip bubble in Holland. So the question is this. Have any of you looked at it? have a sense of the danger it poses to the capital markets, and is there a administrative body that should be, if not regulating, at least closely monitoring the growth of Bitcoin? Boy, do I. Um, uh, the only thing I, I can say is that, I, you know, I, I, I read a little bit about the Mount Grox failure, which no one yet has really explained, but everybody lost their money and, it, and the money just disappeared. So my feeling, feeling is that any kind of market you have where suddenly people's money just disappears and no one has any explanation for it, that looks to me like a Ponzi scheme. So, I mean, my analogy to Bitcoin would be a Ponzi scheme, that it's the greater fool theory, but, you know, it, 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 I have yet to see where all these payoffs are coming from. Everybody's promised payoffs, but where do the payoffs come from? And as you say, there, it's not even clear who's behind it. Um, I've, I've frankly wondered, and, and this is not an area of my expertise, you know, why people like FinCEN haven't been looking into it. Maybe they have, but it, it, it is, a, it is a, a matter of some perplexity to me that that a market like this, which no one is vouching for, no one is regulating, no one is overseeing, and you've already had some collapses, uh, can keep, you know, collecting yeah. a lot of money, apparently. Well, let me can can I respond to that. Oh, you want to say? Okay. Yeah, I'd like to say something about that to. because, and probably Richard does too, but look, our, our economy is great because of innovation. And if people lose money on something like Bitcoin because they've speculated on it and they've lost, mm -hmm. If it's, if it's a Ponzi scheme, then there's a criminal violation there. But let's not get into the business of regulating innovation. Let's let it work out. And if people lose money, that's their problem. Not all. Look, I have the following explanation. I heard the following statement. 
we cannot possibly imagine how people are allowed to put in monies which have systemic failures and there's no really accountability. As I listen to that statement, it seems to me you have to close down every bank in the United States uh, because they all have had very similar problems. Regulatory failure in this country is much more frequent over our life than it is, for example, in Canada where they've never had any of these particular problems. And, and so the danger that you really have about this is if you want to apply it to Bitcoin, you're going to have to apply it to everything else. Um, and at that particular point, it may well be that we're going to start going back to only having gold bullion in order to run our exchange markets. Uh, we, last question. Thanks. Um, Professor, w Professor Wilmarsh, first of all, thank you for coming today. Uh, you decried the tragedy of the federal government having to spend $850 million to bail out Citigroup and Bank of America. And I understand that your take on what happened in 2008 is a little different from the other panelists. But still, we can take certainly as a matter of just judicial notice that there is a strong push coming out of Congress to redress income inequality by asking financial institutions to make loans to people who otherwise would not be qualified. And it's my understanding that FHA losses are astronomical in terms of, in comparison to uh, other forms of loans. So in that sense, the government spends plenty of money on behalf of the taxpayers for its own problems. Could you take a position on that form of lending? Do you decry that socially induced lending also, along with your other concerns about? Oh, yes. I, I've said repeatedly to people, you know, I think this idea about getting people into homes they can't afford makes no sense at all. I mean, what, what is dishonorable about renting? I mean, we, we basically got millions of people into homes they couldn't afford, and then their homes were foreclosed. Uh, they lost everything. They lost their credit ratings. I mean, they're ruined for years. Uh, this was a horribly misplaced policy. So on the, on the idea that, that um, uh, subsidizing housing at the point where people simply can't afford what they're getting themselves into, I, I agree fully. I mean, I think that uh, that, that was a terribly misguided policy. And I, and I, I, I also don't disagree that uh, both the government and the, the largest banks, you know, they, they, there's plenty of responsibility to go around between them. Unfortunately, the biggest banks found that subprime lending was, a, was a, apparently a very profitable thing to do. It was for a short time, but it wasn't for the for, for long term. Look, hmm? I, I have a one sentence answer, um, one word answer. It's called rent. <laughs> <laughs> On that optimistic note, I've got the hook over here. So I, can we thank our panels for. <laughs> thank you very much.